Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us. And now as we come, we pray that you will refresh us, alert our minds, give us an opportunity to get a grasp of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We tonight are on Micah and Nahum. Uh, so here goes. Notice again, and I've been continually calling attention to this, the word of the Lord that came to Micah. In other words, this isn't something off the top of Micah's head, his uh, feelings, his religious opinions, his view of what everything is about. This is from God. It came to Micah. Morasheth, uh, it's a little, not much of a place. About 30 miles southwest of Jerusalem. And uh, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So Judah, we know he's in the southern kingdom. And go with me to the opening chapter of Isaiah for just a moment. So you're holding Micah chapter 1, and we're looking at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. So it says that the word of the Lord came to Micah in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. And now you see Isaiah dating himself, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. So these two prophets are their contemporaries, yes. Uh, Micah's younger, and, uh, but they're on the scene at the same time, obviously. Uh, Uzziah is mentioned, but as you find out from chapter 6 in Isaiah, that uh, he had just died. So Isaiah was not prophesying during the reign of Uzziah, but came on the scene just when he died. But Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the same for both prophets. They are contemporaries. And then it says what he saw concerning, and here we're getting our label for Micah. He saw concerning Samaria, and Jerusalem. Now, someone kindly left us a whole set of maps here. Some Bible school is left. <laughs> what do you know? Uh, so let's see if we can okay. you know, get these over here. And uh, I lent my map to somebody else and see if we can find us an appropriate map. This is not the one that we would want. Uh, this is, is not too, too bad. Uh, uh, let's see. No, no, no. Let's work off this one. Uh, Samaria is up in the, in the north. Uh, let's see if we can get our, can't, is it, is it labeled? Am I missing it? Where is it? Jer Jer Jerusalem is here, and Samaria is in the northern kingdom. This shows the tribes. Let's see if we can get us another one of the United Monarchy. Now, that's in the time of Jesus. But it shows Samaria, so that's good. All right, we'll take this. So it's in the ten-tribe kingdom. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. 
Jerusalem the South. So uh, this is your label. Micah is about the two capitals, basically. That's what he says, verse 1. Samaria, not the region, but the city, the city, which is the capital, and Jerusalem. All right. Now, uh, hear you peoples. Uh, some translations have that nations. Uh, and so this is a broad prophecy here. And O oh, earth, and God is coming down. He's speaking end of two from his holy temple. The Lord three is coming out of his place and he's coming down on these people. It says, verse five, for the transgression of Jacob, for the sins of the house of Israel. And uh, then the transgression of Jacob to be the southern kingdom and is not Samaria. And then the high place of Judah and Jerusalem. So it's just a general pronouncement of judgment on both the northern and southern kingdom for their sinfulness. And I will make Samaria a heap and for the whole the whole city and it, it was wiped out and to this day there's there's nothing there uh, and the problem again is your underlining verse 7 images end of 7 idols and uh, so on then 8 lament wail go strip naked in other words you're troubled 9 your wound is in curable and the trouble has reached end of nine to the very gate of Jerusalem. Uh, then uh, let's, he's talking about exile. Now it is during the time of Micah and Isaiah uh, that Assyria or the northern kingdom, Israel, goes into captivity to Assyria. The date on this is, seven, is 722. And uh, so this is the end of the northern kingdom. Chapter 2, woe to those who devise wickedness. They're coveting, verse 2. And... Uh, there's disaster, verse 3, coming upon them. And then verse 6, do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach such things. In other words, his, his message is of judgment and disaster, and they don't want to hear it. Uh, it's all negative. And so don't preach this. And one should not preach such things. You shouldn't talk about this. Uh, but seven, should this be said, O house of Jacob, for the Lord has grown impatient. In other words, he's had it. Uh, verse eight, lately, my people have risen up as an enemy to the Lord. The Nine, the women of my people you drive out of their del delightful houses, their young children you take away. Now, verse 10 is an allusion to the 210, to the capti captivity. Arise and go. In other words, you're out of here. Now, uh, verse 12. We have the word remnant. This is a key prophetic word. It appears uh, about 70 times in 17 different books. It always, verse 12, remnant of chapter 2. And uh, 
it always refers to though the nation has gone into idolatry and though there's going to be punishment and though uh, everything seems bad, there is always, always a remnant. In other words, a minority of people who have not gone into idolatry, a minority of people who are godly. And so this, this phrase keeps, keeps pop, popping up. Of end of verse 13 is messianic. The king passes by before them, the Lord at their head, that unfulfilled yet coming. But the remnant, uh, chase this down to, to New Testament times. When the New Testament opens, you can almost count the remnant on the fingers of your two hands. It's so small. The people after the captivity had drifted away from the Lord again. And uh, so you got uh, the religion had become outward instead of inward. It was all ritual and, and uh, something that was just done rather than a worship from the heart. So the remnant at the opening of the New Testament, you can, you can name them Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, uh, the old fellow in the temple, you know. Samuel. What? Samuel. Yeah. And, and Anna, the prophetess, she, she got about half a dozen. I mean, it is a literally a handful. It's amazing. And that we're true, true to the Lord. And the rest uh, had drifted off. But in the northern kingdom, a remnant. Southern kingdom, there was also. Now... Uh, chapter 3, you heads, uh, that could also be translated princes, you princes of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. It's not for you to know justice, don't you know what justice is? You who hate the good and love the evil. Ah. Sort of like where our country is at the present time, you know. And uh, the, uh, the courts, uh, it's, it's rare to get, uh, to get justice. And uh, Cook County, the court system is basically political and not separate from the rest of the government as it ought to be. And so there's no, is it not for you to know justice? No, they don't have it. Now, five, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. In other words, they're false prophets. Their message is what? Verse five. What? Peace, and while while the uh, Assyrians are getting ready to devour them, uh, and you you got some prophets with with peace, and that's their message. Therefore, six, it will be night for you, darkness for you. Verse eight. But as for me, Micah speaks for himself. I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and might. And hear this, verse 9, now he's down. Uh, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. And, and 
who detest justice and make crooked all that is is straight. And uh, let's see, verse 12, because of you Zion, that's Jerusalem, shall be plowed as a field. Chapter 4, chapter 4, the latter days or the last days, key prophetic phrase again, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains be lifted up, so on. Uh, verse 2, many nations shall come, say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. Toward the end of verse 6, from Zion the law will go forth. This is unfulfilled. This is in the, the last time. It's obviously takes place when what has occurred? What, 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 what? The rapture. Well, if still more. The temple. The, the temple, the house of the Lord shall be. The temple will be rebuilt, yes. That's called Zion, so, and it's, it's several names. This is Mount Moriah. It's Zion, and uh, that, that, by the way, is uh, it's it's been built up. You go up there. It's it's a long, flat place, but it wasn't. It was a it was a it was a mount. And what they did is, you, you hear about the wall, you know, where the Jews pray, the wall. That is not the wall of the temple. It's not the wall of some building. This is a retaining wall. For they, to get that large, large flat place where the mosque is now and where the temple will be, they had to fill in, and that, that wall was built there. And so when you see pictures of the Jews praying at this wall, <coughs> the wall is not a part of any, never was, part of any building. But it's a retaining wall that makes possible that large flat place up on top, yes. So according to this passage, will the temple be built on... Uh Zion, Mount Zion? Yes. It will. Yeah. So the mosque, where the mosque is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is the fuss, of course, you know. This is where, where, where it will be. And the law will go forth. All of this, all of this is unfulfilled. It's verse 1, the latter, the latter days. And this phrase down in 3, beat their swords into plowshares, in other words, it's a time of peace. Spears into pruning hooks, the nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and so on. Uh, for every man under his vine and under his fig tree. You find a similar passage to this in Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, almost word for word, the same, Isaiah 2. And when we come down to verse 6, in that day, the day, the latter day. Yes, question. So, is this during a peace time during the... We're in the millennium. Okay, that's what it looked like? Yeah. So it's not during yeah. uh, peace time in the tribulation? No, 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 no. This, this is into the millennium. All the trouble, the, the trouble is past, which makes the whole passage messianic, of course. And then in that day declares the Lord, I'll assemble the lame, verse 6, and the lame, I will make, verse 7, remnant, remnant, or back up a little into 6, gather those who've been driven away. 
and uh, verse 7, right in the middle, the, you underline this, the Lord will reign. This is the millennium, thousand-year period when Christ reigns on earth. Oh, two, three, as many as you want. <laughs> so this temple that is on, on Mount Zion, is that the temple that Christ will reign from? Yes, he'll reign from Jerusalem. And this, he will reign from the temple that is built? Yes, this is the millennial temple. We're going to get to this in much more detail when we get to Ezekiel, particularly the 40th chapter. Here it just mentions it. There you have in Ezekiel a <coughs> detail on it, uh, so on. Now, uh, oh, let's see, the Lord will, but now we're back again to their, their time. Look in the middle of verse 10. He's speaking to the southern kingdom. You shall go to Babylon. Wow. That's interesting because Babylon did not exist as a powerful nation at this time. It was Assyria that was dominant. So this, from the point of view of when this was written, it doesn't make sense. Now, the uh, northern kingdom going into Assyria, yeah, but going to Babylon. And of course, this is the element of prophecy. It's a miracle. Uh, and this is the, the point that at the time it's given, you, you, you know, your head is filled with question marks. How can this be? And yet all these things come to pass. There they are, Babylon, you're going to go. Now, verse 11, many nations assembled against you, let her be defiled, and on, so on. Uh, plug in Psalm 2 and read that. Uh, that's messianic, of course. Now, of uh, chapter 5, muster your troops, O daughter of troops, siege is laid against us with a rod, they shall strike the judge of Israel on the cheek, but you, Bethlehem, uh, that word means house of bread, Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah. It is, it's, you know, it's very small. It's just a village at the time. From you shall come forth the one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth is from old, from ancient days. So obviously this is messianic and refers to the first coming of Christ. And yet, and, and you find this again and again, like in Isaiah 9, 6, you, you find without even in the Hebrew any punctuation uh, reference to Christ's first coming and his second coming. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. First coming. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Uh, there's, there's, you know, not a comma in between there. And they're thousands of years apart. Uh, it's amazing. And this is, of course, what throws some people. And here, again, uh, Bethlehem, but he's going to be a ruler. Now, there's something else interesting with this. Uh, you can underline the phrase, who's going or who's coming forth, uh, underline that. 
in the Hebrew, it's the same phrase for being born, who's coming out of the womb, but it doesn't refer to his human nature, body getting from Mary whose going forth is from old, even from ancient of days, or everlasting. From this you get the theological phrase, the eternal generation of the Son. So the question comes, you have the Father, the Son. Where do we get these terms? Where do we... Father, Son, where do we get these? Aren't they from our re relationships that we know? Uh, so we're seizing on what we know, God the Father, God the Son. But the question comes, in human relationships, who is older? The Father. In this relationship, who is older? <coughs> huh? They're the same. They're the same. In other words, there never was a time when he came into existence, Jesus. There never was a time when he became the Son. Uh, there's no time element in this. He always was the Son. There's a, uh, the human relationship is used to describe this, but he's was always the Father, and He was always the Son, and you have to erase the time element whose going forth is from eternity, from ancient times, from everlasting, whatever translation you pick up. But this goes down into the future. Now, there's something else here. Bethlehem. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. There is a big problem. Mary and Joseph don't live in Bethlehem. They don't even live there. They're way up in the north, in Galilee, in Nazareth. Now, so uh, a woman is pregnant. No mother knows exactly where this child will be born. You have plans. You have an idea. But you don't know. You've heard all the stories. Uh, taxi cabs and everything else, you know. Our first... Uh, we lived in Worth at the time, uh, the closest hospital then, 51, 1951, was Little Company in Evergreen Park. Christ Hospital was back in the city of an, under another name. And so our doctor was an Oak Lawn Gasteyer, after whom a school is named in Oak Lawn, and the hospital was Little Company. So comes the morning, you know, and my wife says, you'd better call the doctor. So I called him, and he said, well, we'll meet you at the hospital. I'm coming back from the phone. My wife says, we're not going to make it to the hospital. So I'm presiding. I'm back to the phone. Uh, the baby has come. So 
but he was almost like an old country doctor. He came to the house, finished up, you know, cut and tied, uh, and uh, and uh, brought his wife with him. She's a nurse. She cleaned the baby up in the kitchen sink. <laughs> But this was not, not the plan. Uh, it was not my wife's plan, it was not mine, and it was not the doctor's plan. And uh, so you, you, you don't know. But here, and, and there is this terrible problem of Nazareth, and you have the uh, head of the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus. Uh, here, here's good. The Roman world. This isn't all of it. Th this, th this, this is huge. It was the Middle East. It's all of Asia Minor. So this is uh, the Roman Empire. It's all of North Africa. But it keeps on going up here. It's all of France. It's England. The Roman Empire was, no, no one had had anything like this. And this is the man that makes a decree that people have to go to their hometown, the town of their ancestry, to enroll so he can collect some taxes from them. And he did not realize that that decree at that time that he was in the hands of God moving Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem so that this prophecy, how many years before the birth is Micah 5 to? Seven, seven, 700 years before. So uh, no conception has taken place. Mary does not exist, obviously. And th this is the, the wonder of prophecy. All this talk about proving the Bible. Skip all the other stuff. Fulfilled prophecy. That alone is mind-boggling. And here's just one of them. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time and so on, and the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, uh, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock, and so on. Now, we're down to five. When the Assyrian comes into our land, Second Kings 18.13, that's the northern kingdom. Then verse 7, the remnant, the remnant again. Verse 8, the remnant shall be among the nations, the remnant. And verse 10, that day, it's a final day. And then everything is cleaned up at the end. Uh, verse 12, you don't have any fortune tellers anymore. You don't have any idols anymore. Verse 13, and everything gets straightened out. So, chapter 6, hear what the Lord says, plead your cause, and so on. Hear you must, and so on. Uh, I have an indictment against you, verse 2. The Lord has an indictment against his people. Uh, oh, a famous text is 6, 8. He's told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justly, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Uh, that's a famous text from Micah. And uh, then the judgment, uh, oh, verse, you know, verse dishonesty, verse 11, the wicked scales and deceitful weights, uh, cheating people, uh, so on. Oh, chapter 7. Uh, 
2, verse 2, the godly are perished from the earth. They lie in wait for blood. Uh, 3, the hands are what is evil. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe. The way this works in Chicago, Cook County, is you get an attorney. You're sunk if you don't have an attorney. And the attorney has a fee that he charges you. So you pay the attorney. Uh, what's it supposed to be? You don't know. You pay. Part of that goes to the judge in a unmarked envelope in cash. And so you didn't know, but uh, the, the judge is taken, taken care of. And uh, how, how many times in Chicago has someone been pulled over by the police and you, you always, you know, wrap a tan around your driver's license when you hand it to the, to the officer. And uh, this, this is the way the system works. And it is wrong, dead wrong. This is the bribe, you know. And verse 4, the day, and so on. Uh, Let's see. Oh, like we said, it shifts from judgment to grace and mercy. Where a chapter, the last chapter, verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? 19. Cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. There's always uh, mercy for those and forgiveness for those who repent. Oh, so we've settled up a little bit on Micah. You got it? Isaiah, Micah, southern kingdom, but he's speaking to both. And it's during this time that the Assyrians come down and haul off the, the captives from the uh, northern kingdom. And by the way, uh, they don't take everybody. You, you know what they want. They want y young people who will make good workmen, slaves, servants. Uh, they leave the old people behind. And uh, people who uh, aren't quite with it. They, they take the best the, is what it amounts to. And the people, and then so the land would not be uh, abandoned and not cultivated. They brought in other people, pagans. And so the Assyrians put these other pagans in. They mixed with the Jews that were there, and that's where the Samaritan race came from that you hear about, the Samaritans. This goes back to the time of the Assyrian captivity. Well, we're to Nahum. To Nahum. So, verse 1, what is Nahum all about? Nineveh. Nineveh. All right, you've underlined it. And we have two books that are two Bible books that are about Nineveh. Jonah. Jonah. Jonah and Nahum. And they are about 150 years apart. Uh, Jonah comes on the scene and uh, the people repent and they're spared for several generations, but they've gone astray again. And so God is going to, they've had their chance. God is going to come down on them. And that's what this is about. So uh, Nineveh is mentioned, Nineveh is the capital of 
Assyria, and uh, well, we got enough maps here. We should be able to 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 find this. Let's go back a little bit. You you hear on the news Mosul. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here's Nineveh up here, Assyria. Uh, and just across the river is Mosul, which you hear about on the news. Uh, and uh, Nineveh's on the other side of the river. Been a tremendous excavations at Nineveh uh, that are just astounding. Nineveh's mentioned 24 times in the Bible in nine, nine different uh, Bible books. And let's see what we want to pick up from this. Uh, hmm. Verse 4, he rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up the rivers. Nineveh is close to the Tigris, but there is another river that comes in. It's not shown on the map that flows into the Tigris and that dried up at that time. Uh, verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Uh, chapter 2, let's go. The scatterer has come up against you. These are the Medes. The Medes and the Persians. So get our nations in order here. The great empires. You have Assyria, then Babylonia, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. There's your ancient history in one sentence, one after the other. And uh, chapter 2, they come and they plunder the silver, that's, and they plunder the gold, uh, that's in 2 Kings 18, 14 to 16. There was a group of our people, small, who went last Saturday to the Oriental Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, any of you? No. no. Have you ever, any? You've never. never been there. Yeah. You have. Okay. You got to get this on your list. It's free. Uh, you you don't wander through alone. You go with a, a tour. They have docents who will walk you through. This is the greatest collection of ancient biblical artifacts anywhere in our country. Uh, to beat this, you'd have to go to the British Museum or to the museum in Berlin because the Germans did a lot of uh, excavating, excavating. Uh, it's, you know, we go every place else. This, this is worth a, a look. Uh, James Breasted, who was a great archeologist, was kind of the founder of the Oriental Institute. 100 years ago. It's on the campus of the University of Chicago. It's right, to, you know, when you go down the Midway, you know where Rockefeller Chapel is with the, the steeple. It's just about behind there. And if you go on a Saturday, uh, the parking's easy. During the week, <laughs> you don't know what to do with your car because of the students. Uh, but <clears throat> Saturday is a good day. And uh, there 
is one monument in there. It's a replica of the black obelisk, uh, which is a monument. The original is in the British muse Museum, and it shows the king of Judah bowing down before uh, the, the Assyrians. And it, it's, there's a panel on it that shows this. So all of that's on here. I'll cut off your prey from the earth, the last verse of two. Your voice, messengers, no longer. Uh, so there again. All right, let's see what else we've got to wind up here. But uh, Nahum is Nineveh. Nahum is Nineveh. Uh, next week, let's get into Jeremiah. Read chapters 1 to 23. Jeremiah is in the southern kingdom. And uh, he's the one who is involved in the collapse of the city. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you now for these moments. Make us diligent in pursuing your truth that we may enrich our lives and help others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While I'm on it, there are two things that 